Hi and welcome to Misconceptions, a program that is committed to rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm your host, Rommel Gassain, and today we have with us Bob Mendelssohn from Jews for Jesus, who will be discussing with us the very important topic of how to share your faith, that is the gospel, with Jewish people. First of all, welcome to the show, Bob. Thanks so much. Always a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to have you come and share some of your insights with us. So you heard the topic for the show for this evening. I'm hoping perhaps you can show us or guide us through the best approach, because I know there's a lot of wrong approaches. On the first segment, you shared with us the wrong approach. Well, you know, it's funny. Even wrong approaches, or at least approaches. Yes. And God has to use an approach. It, he doesn't preach from heaven, so you've got to do the talking, or the, the believers out there who are watching have to give it a go, have to talk, have to try it, you know, preach the gospel. Well, I'm not very good at it. Okay, well, <laughs> give it a go. You know, well, I don't know what to say. Well, at least say something, because the, the faith of Yeshua attaches itself, if you will, to the words that are expressed by believers. So people, th that's what the Bible says, faith comes by hearing. So the unbelievers have to hear it or they can't believe it. That's right. Also speak as the oracles of God, you know. That's too, as, that's too impressive. Yes. You know, yeah. oracles. It sounds like some <laughs> great prophet of old and Mrs. Johnson of Iowa and, uh, and Dr. Smith sitting there in East London says, yeah, I'm, not very, I'm not very clever and I'm not very strong and I'm not very eloquent. Okay. And, and so you give them a word like oracle and they're intimidated. It's too much. Yeah, That's share, just point. share the Bible. Well, the Bible's just so thick. Well, okay, so share your story. A lot of people say, well, I'll tell them that I'm a Christian. To a Jew, all Gentiles are Christians. So of course you're a Christian. You're not Jewish. So what are you telling me? You're telling me something I don't know. I'd say the first thing you want to do in talking to Jewish folk is make sure that they know that you care about them. We call it friendship. You call, I mean, most people call it friendship. Make sure that Mrs. Goldberg across the street knows that you really care about her, that she's your friend, that you're her friend. Uh, if that means extending a gesture of friendship to her, if that means uh, taking over some, you know, cakes not on Passover, but you know something, uh, pick it up at the Jewish bakery or some you know, something. Look it up on the internet that says this is kosher. It's okay <laughs> to take, or a card or flowers or anything like that. Um, let them know that it's okay to be who they are. However, is there like a little bit of resistance to start off with sure. when you go to, to, to share your faith with a Jew, especially if they know that you're a Christian because of the, uh, you know, what happened in the Middle Ages and because perhaps they might think that, you know, Christians hate Jews. Is that already there, that yeah, mindset? Yeah, it's deep in the craw. It, it is so thick uh, because the history of the church, at least since the fourth century, hasn't exactly been too good towards Jews. Yes. In the 12th century, uh, sorry, 13th century, Jews were kicked out of England, out of York. In the 15th century, after the golden century, where Jews were prominent, like in New York City, you know, prominent as all get out. In the 15th century, out of Spain, Jews were kicked out again. After the Inquisition and the horrors that that is, when Jews were so prominent in society and culture and poetry and medicine and all these things, you get out of here with nothing on your back. In 1516, the Jews were incarcerated in the first ghetto in Venice in Italy. I'm saying all these pieces because they are part and parcel of why Jews say, scratch a Gentile and you'll find an anti-Semite. There is a great wall between the Jew and the Gentile. Uh, for most Western, European, uh, Anglo-looking Christians to the ordinary Jew, there's a hostility, a wall of uh, careful consideration that says, I'm going to be separate from you so that I can be preserved as us. There's an us-them mentality. Uh, but when, uh, when an Asian Christian attempts to share the gospel, or uh, yeah, anyone from different countries comes to the Jewish birth. When a Filipino comes to, uh, when a Chinese, when a Korean, the Jewish person, I don't know what, I don't know who they are. I don't know much about their history. I don't know if they, do they like me? Do they hate me? I don't know much. Have they ever been persecuting? I don't think so. But so there's, there's an advantage for the Asian Christian over against the Western 
European Christian. Sure, and so you just approach that with a, a, an attitude of friendliness and try and be hospitable, yeah. try and do some things, and then try and start a dialogue ask through questions. that. Okay. Ask questions, ask the, questions. The way like you do with me is you ask questions and I get to talk, yes. and Jews like that, and I'm just like that. <laughs> so you lead the conversation not with statements, but with questions. Okay. So you're guiding me through these, these conversations, and every time we're on together, you're asking me questions so that I can talk. That means you're in charge, even though it sounds like I'm making all the declarations. <laughs> in the same way, that's how you do it with Mrs. Goldberg and Dr. Cohen and, and uh, Mr. Rosenthal. That, that's how you do it. You ask questions, sympathetic questions, like, you know, do you ever think there'll be peace in the Middle East, a and how? Uh, do you ever, uh, what do you do at your, do you go to synagogue? And, and when you do go, do you, what, what do you do there? Because I read about things in the Bible and I'm not sure, can I go with you sometime to synagogue and just see? I mean, the sympathetic questions are not leading questions. Yes. A leading question is, say, have you read Isaiah 53 lately? <laughs> that would be a leading question. But a sympathetic, you don't know the answer. So yeah, go ahead and ask. And also share a word, not a long, personal testimony, a word of personal story. How it was that you, as a godless atheist, unbeliever, Gentile, came to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you can share your own story about how you went from not to, from con to pro, to pro-God, uh, when you can share that story in a very short manner, I can do it in an hour, I can do it in about 30 seconds. And you wanna do the shorter version. <laughs> because you don't know if they're really interested. That's but right. Answer, answer their, their questions from the Bible. I, I, you should have a, a Hebrew, English, older testament if you wanna to talk to one of those Jewish folk. Do you guys um, provide one of those? Can we, you get it from, we can from work the it out. Yes. Yeah, we can work it out. Of course. <laughs> yeah, the, the issues, uh, the, the availability of Hebrew, English, or at least Jewish Publication Society Bibles is, is pretty, it's available. Yes. There's, there's abundance of that. Uh, you want to have that because that's the book, if they did believe the Bible, that they would believe. Okay. Of course, you don't know if they do. That's part of your questions. You're finding out, do you believe that the Bible's true? Do you believe the Bible's the Word of God? Um, you're, you say you're a Jew. Do you think there's a difference between Jews and Gentiles? Do you think, are you better because you're chosen? You are chosen, aren't you? Things like that. And then you find out what, they're really, what their views on God and themselves, you find out a lot that way. And you step on the platform then that they answer. Who do you think Jesus is? Yes. Well, I think he was a good man, a prophet, a rabbi, a teacher. You know, whatever. Oh, yeah, well, that's true. He was a prophet. Have you ever heard what he prophesied about you, about me, about himself, about God, etc.? So you step on the platform that their questions answer supplies. Wow. And so what are some of the things that you could say to lead them to Jesus? Sometimes I feel as though that if you were to mention Jesus, then that would straight away ring alarm bells and that would offend a Jew. I know a, lot of, I know a lot of Jewish believers will say that you should always call him Yeshua, his Hebrew name, that his mother Miriam and father Yosef would have called him. Uh -huh. See, then the Jew feels more comfortable as long as they understand about whom you're speaking. So Moish Rosen was the founder of Jews for Jesus and he used to tell a story about this woman who came to his meetings Oh, this was back in Los Angeles in the late 60s. And she came up to him and said, I just love the way you talk. You're like a rabbi. Because they had these like, like worship services and he was the teacher, so he was like the rabbi. And he would always talk about Yeshua. So for three, four weeks she was there. One day she came up, I just love that Yeshua you talk about too. And Moish said, you know I'm talking about Jesus, don't you? <sighs> no, scandalized. She never came back. Wow. So, so I who think, did she think? Well, it, someone else, like okay. some other guy. Wow. So we have to be careful that we're communicating clearly. At the same time, we're ethnosensitive. So you want to be good to Jewish folk. You want to talk about Messiah, not Christ. You want to say, uh, 
Hebrew scriptures instead of Old Testament, things like that, that are buzzwords that they're comfortable with and you can adjust your vocabulary better than they can. Yes. If you've got a Macintosh and, an, and a PC, sometimes things don't cross platform, you know? <laughs> but it's easier if you change your language than making them change That's theirs. That's right. And I suppose our concern here is that there's only one message that truly saves. Yeah. And, and the reason why we want any person to be able to come to the knowledge of Christ is so that they can share the same eternal life that you and I have. Perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Tell us, what is that message? And the message is, of eternal life? Yes. Oh my, that we're stopped. You know, because the, the reality is we're all living for ourselves. Uh, you don't have to tell too many two-year-olds that, you don't have to teach them how to say no. For some reason, rebellion is bound in the heart of a child. We, we all do what we want to do, and, and uh, you stub your toe. It doesn't matter what else is going on that day in your office or at your home. All you can think about is your stupid toe. <laughs> it's like the great, but you cradle it. But what do you say it? that you're living for yourself? I mean, there's so many people that are out there which do a lot of good deeds and a lot of good works, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. So what do you mean by... Uh, you know, living for the, yourself. Yeah, look, I appreciate people benefiting the world, whether it's uh, with some food, care agency, or yes, yeah. food, clothing, shelter, some basic needs. I'm so yeah. glad that people want to go and provide water in foreign countries yes. or build bridges. Excellent, good yes. idea. Um, so, uh, end of the day, when they're at home, when they're, they've done their two years or their four years in their care and their UNICEF and they're, they're serving the world. What do they want when they go back home? And the folks that have been generous and giving to others uh, know full well how little they really give. A real person who really knows themselves knows how self-consumed they are. And whether the outside world notices us or not, that's a whole other story. You could have asked if you had the chance to interview Mother Teresa. Mm. You would have said, Mother Teresa, you're so wonderful. In Calcutta, you do so much for so many. She would have said, I wish I could have done more. I don't really do wow. that much. Schindler from Schindler's List, that great movie that won the Academy Award, many Academy Awards, uh, including Best Picture. You felt Oscar Schindler's pain at the right end at the when end, he said, yes. I could have done more. I could have sold this and gotten more. Because a truly giving person, a truly self-aware person knows how self-consumed they really are. And the reality is that's what the Bible calls sin. Look, we all want to get to somewhere and we all fall short of it. That gap is sin. And God has sent his son Jesus to die for us, to bridge that gap and bring us back into relationship with him. End of the day, we have to realize it's a gap that's as big as the Atlantic Ocean. And no matter how much concrete we have, we're never going to pave it all the way across. We're going to end up splashing in our own emptiness. And as soon as we get there, we're a good candidate for eternal life. Because that's when we cry out to the God who is on the other side, inescapably on the other side, available on the other side. And when we admit our helplessness to reach the other side, he and he alone can come. In fact, he did come from the other side in the person of Jesus to us so that we can have eternal life. That reality of I can't and you can is what becoming a believer is all about. And how is it that we do that? How do we become a believer? We cry out for help. We admit our helplessness. We say, I can't. I mean, end of the day, it's not really the words. It's the heart, isn't it? It's yes. the heart that says, I'm a mess. I've lived for myself. I wish everybody else would, would do whatever they do, but I just need to get fixed and I'm broken and I don't know where to turn. And they say, God's the repairer. God's the creator, sustainer, redeemer. He can fix me. He can buy me back. Oh, Lord, come and do that for me. So it's a cry from a desperate heart. That's how anybody comes to faith or becomes a believer or gets fixed. You admit you can't, that he can. And you say, it, it, you know, the words don't matter so much, but if you want words, here they are. Father, forgive me in Jesus' name. If you do that, then 
it comes to fruition. God, make me born again. Lord, I turn my life over to you. I accept Jesus as my Savior. Any of those from a non-desperate heart is simply words. Any of those from a desperate heart makes you born again wow, and gives yes. you eternal life. Wow. And so it's not so much like you said, the words that you say, but it's the attitude that you come to God with. And what I'm trying to hone in on here is the importance or the preeminence of Jesus Christ. And is this something which uh, a Jew would be especially resistant to? Initially, we're resistant to Jesus because we saw him as the God of the Goyim, the God of the Gentiles. He's done so much against us in the Crusades, the Inquisitions, and Hitler's Holocaust. But when we get past that and realize Jesus had nothing to do with any of those, and he was crying as much as any of our people. On well, tell us about him, sorry. About Jesus? Yeah, tell us about him. How, oh how is he different, you know? Oh, he's... Was he a troublemaker? Was he a renegade? What, yes. What, what was he? Yes, he was all that. And he was the man of peace. He was a man of sorrows, well acquainted with grief. One like from whom we all hid our faces. Uh, not beautiful, nothing fantastic that we should be attracted to him. We even hid our faces from him, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace fell on him, and with his stripes we can be healed. All of us, like sheep, went astray. Uh, we turned each of us to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the Jesus we're talking about. By the way, those verses that I just quoted was from Isaiah chapter 53. Yes. And when I first read that to my mother, she thought I was reading from the New Testament. No, Mom, that's Isaiah, the Jewish prophet. Wow. And he's writing about somebody who's dying in our place. This is a, this is a, he put up his hand. He said, I'll go. He put up his hand regularly when he was tempted in every way, like, his, like you and I, but he was without sin. Um, he prayed earnestly early in the morning and gained strength from his father that he could go out and do the things that he had to do, caring about people who were pretty unlovable and loving people who were pretty unthankful, healing people who didn't always turn around and say, good on you, mate. And here he was, the God of the universe, coming down to us, sort of like if we ran a universe and, and there were some ants and we wanted to care for those ants and we became an ant. And we'd walk around, walk around and say, hi, I'm, I'm here, I'm Joe Carpenter, you know, I'm trying to fix things. And, and they'd say, yeah, get out of here. And they'd nail him to a little ant tree. Well, that's what happened to Jesus. He, but he did that willingly. You know, some people want to make a big point about who killed Jesus. Yeah, oh, oh, big stink came out with The Passion of the Christ, that movie by Mel yes. Gibson. Big stink. Oh, they're blaming the Jews. Look, there are five agents involved in the death of Christ. The five are the Father who sent His only Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shouldn't perish but have eternal life. Uh, there were some Jewish people who dobbed Him in. Sure, that, you know, some Jewish leaders, not everybody, turned Him in to the Romans who executed Him. The Jewish people didn't execute anybody. The Roman, the Italians. Does that mean we should never eat pasta again? I th Look, we can't be anti-anybody because of these things. But the Roman government, through, through the agencies that they had set in place, did the execution of Jesus in a Roman way. The fourth is Jesus himself. He said in John chapter 10, No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own initiative. And the fifth is you and me. It's our sins. He died for our sins. Without that, well, we'd be unforgivable, unforgiven. So he died in our place. We deserved it. He didn't. So even though this was something that occurred some 2,000 years ago, he, uh, our sin still cost him his death, his okay. life. Wow, that's an amazing thing. And I think when, as you describe uh, the Jesus of the Bible that way, you just find this attraction to him. You, you, you can't really find anything that you would be upset about. And I think the amazing thing is, is that, I mean, you mentioned some key words, and one of them was religion. 
and Christ, Jesus Christ himself was so against religion. Uh, you know, that religion that is so Religion against, that traps you, religion that's custom over reality or yes, substance. Yes, interested in the outside, the externality, but not what's on the inside. Yeah, when it's external only. Yes. Now, he's not opposed to externals. I mean... He, but it's got a match, yes. Yeah, when at the Passover meal, he took a cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the cup was not the first cup, it wasn't the second cup. Oh, mind you, every person at the table would only have one cup, which is filled four times. That's a tradition. Yeshua picked up a traditional cup. In other words, it's not biblical. It's not something that was uh, heretical or holy by itself. It just was a tradition. He's not opposed to traditions. He's opposed to empty traditions or traditions that only uh, are vain, that are repetitious for the sake of repetitious for the sake of repetitious. What? What's that about? What he's opposed to is emptiness. And what he wants to give us is substance. And that might look religious to some. And I, that's okay. I don't mind. Look, if people gather in communities or churches every Sunday, oh yeah, well that's church, <laughs> that's religion. Well, okay. Call it whatever you will. At the football match, you know, there are people who go every Saturday, every Sunday. They're there. That's their, that's their religion. Well, nobody says you can't do that. I'm just going to have my religion at home. You go to the footy match. You know, it's an exciting thing. So church is not wrong. Religion's not wrong in the, in the biblical sense. The externals without the internals, that's empty. That's right. External with the internal, that's full. Wow. The other thing is that you mentioned Isaiah 53 as though it was a no-go zone when you're talking to a Jew. Why is that? Oh, well, it isn't a no-go zone, but for some it is. Uh, they are afraid of it. No, no, no. Isaiah 53 is fantastic. It's one of those many prophecies like Isaiah 7:14 or Micah 5:2 or Daniel 9, or 24 Psalm to 27. Yes, Psalms, yeah. Beautiful. These messianic prophecies that are predictive about the coming one, are clarifying in toto that Yeshua is the Messiah. So I'm not afraid to use Isaiah 53. Some Christians think that Isaiah 53 is not in the Jewish Bible. Well, that's silly. That's where it came from. Uh, otherwise, 54 would be 53. So no, it's all in there. That's right. But I mean, is that uh, section, that chapter, is it talking about one to come or mm. is it referring to Isaiah? Uh, the or to Psalms Israel or, itself. Or Israel itself. Yeah, modern, with Psalm uh, 22. Yeah, modern Jews have changed their theology um, in the Middle Ages on, from Isaiah 53 representing a person to Isaiah 53 representing Israel. So there were Jews that used to believe that was a prediction or a prophecy about the uh, prophet to come. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's what we have to appeal to is what the rabbis always taught about Isaiah 53 long before Rashi and Rambam in the Middle Ages to kind of change things. Uh, prominent rabbis, prominent and, and good rabbis who interpreted well, but sometimes they interpreted on the basis of what they were saying, the Catholics, and we're going to be the other guys. <laughs> rather than what does the text say. And that is not a good way to do theology. Good way to do theology is to read it and believe it and practice it, uh, no matter what other people are saying. And, oh, well, if they say that, phew, I don't like them, so we're going <laughs> to interpret it another way. That's, that's not good theology, not good hermeneutics. And uh, Isaiah 53 is great in that regard. So I encourage anyone who is Mm, trying to work on this, and you're not yet a believer. Uh, read Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. That's what we call Isaiah 53. And see what it says to you. See about whom the prophet is speaking. This was written 700 years before Jesus rocked up on the earth. And what is Isaiah on about? And who is he about? Who is he talking about? Yes, that's right. You and I are convinced that that's Jesus. Yes, without a doubt, you know. And I mean, the, the, the understanding that we have through that is that someone would come and lay their life down so that we would be able to have life. And I think often people that are even outside of religion itself ask themselves those questions, why is it that we're here? Why is it that we live for some 70, 80 or 100 years and, and then that's it, it's all over? 
you know, and the only answer that I found, even myself through my own personal experiences, is that this Savior, this Jesus Christ, as declared through the Scriptures, is the one who provides the answer, the solution to my deep and inner needs. And, and I, I find that, you know, all our hearts are alike. You know, mm -hmm. you know, everyone has this need and everyone has this capacity within them, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, whether, whatever cultural difference, you know, different background you're from. And the only way we're able to uh, make or have peace with God or have that satisfaction, uh, that contentment is through uh, Jesus. So uh, I suppose that leads me to another question is that some of the resources that you do provide through uh, your website, perhaps if you can tell us uh, the, the website, how people can access that. People get on their computers, yes. Google <laughs> Jews and Jesus and they'll get right to us. Uh -huh. that, that'll be the easiest. Jews for Jesus, all spelled out, dot org, dot au. That's here we are here in Australia. Is there some it, good books that you would recommend oh, we, for people we to... We sell 700 products. So wow. we've got loads of stuff, categorized, apologetic. Look, there's apologetics, which doesn't mean you're sorry. It's just a way of defending what you believe. Lots of great books out there in that regard. For Jewish people, the Answering Jewish Objection series by Michael Brown, the Yeshua book by Moish Rosen, uh, Jesus Was a Jew, and other books by Arnold Fruchtenbaum, uh, are brilliant in that regard. Uh, Messianic Judaism by David Stern, good stuff that helps unpack a whole lot of issues for Jewish folk. Um, apologetics. Uh, Non-Jewish particular books like Letters from a Skeptic by Boyd, uh, which is a series of letters. Um, uh, the Christian and the Pharisee, another series of letters between a rabbi and a pastor, Kendall and Rosen. Great stuff for answering how people really should struggle with it. The Reason for God by Tim Keller. Tremendous book, unpacking real issues about suffering and pain and what's going on in the world. Philip Yancey, my hero, I mean, greatest writer out there. Uh, any of his books, What's So Amazing About Grace, number one. And then, testimony. Those are the two great angles of evangelism. Apologetics, answering their real objections, and giving clues for, not really proofs, of God. And then the other one is testimony. They say, okay, fine, Jesus is the Savior. Are any other Jews believing this? <laughs> so testimonies are so good. My own testimony called, Who Ever Heard of a Jewish Missionary? That's a good one. Of course, I think it's a good <laughs> one. And people can read all about me and see photos, embarrassing photos from my long distant past. Uh, uh, testimonies, uh, stories of Jews for Jesus, that's we, when we publish. There are Jewish doctors' stories, there are testimonies of Holocaust survivors, loads and loads, and DVDs that have vis visual testimonies, like survivor stories or forbidden peace. Great stuff that'll help the ordinary Christian piece it together and pass it on to the Jewish Inquirer. Wow. Bob, thank you once again. That brings us to the end of the episode for sharing some of your insights with us. Shalom. To our viewers, I pray and hope also that you found this episode to be an immense blessing. You know, it's so often that we do discuss these topics with people and I've never even read the Bible from cover to cover. Are you one of these people? Perhaps you are. If you haven't read the Bible, please read it. And as Bob was saying, see what God says through it to you. And until then, please stay tuned for the very next episode of Misconceptions. Goodbye, Congress.